first lecture in the annual series in honor of the great mathematician Andrei Nikolaevich Kolmogorov. First of all, I must apologize that the principal is unable to be here this evening. He's uh, at the annual residential conference of Universities UK. God bless him. <laughs> Uh, my name, uh, for those of the visitors to the college who don't know me, my name is Norman Gower, and uh, I'm standing in for the principal this evening by virtue of the fact that I'm the chairman of the organizing committee for this series of lectures. Uh, it so happens that I'm also a past principal for Royal Holloway, so it's great fun to be back on old, old halls, and uh, it's a great pleasure to be here this evening. I'd like to thank the Royal Statistical Society, which Computer Society for their support uh, for this event, and the Department of Computer Science here at Royal Holloway uh, for doing all the work. It's particularly appropriate that the department should be hosting this uh, series of lectures because it itself is doing such outstanding work in the development of the application of ideas that were of particular interest to Kolmogorov. It's hard to imagine a more appropriate person to inaugurate this series than Professor Solomonov. He is without doubt a world leader in his field, and it's a true honor to have him with us this evening. He not only fits the criteria for these lectures by virtue of his outstanding work in areas connected to the work of Kolmogorov, but he was, of course, there at the start of complexity theory, developing the ideas of complexity independently of Kolmogorov and from a different starting point. It's probably true to say, it may not be true to say, but uh, it's probably true to say that Kolmogorov's primary interest in complexity was to find a way of connecting his theoretical basis for probability with more intuitive and familiar ideas of probability. Professor Solomonov has always had a particular interest in the practical applications of algebraic complexity, and it is this that we are to hear about this evening. And so without further ado, may I invite you to give this evening's inaugural lecture in the annual Kolmogorov series. Now, in general, there are going to be a lot of programs like that. I write S 
specify is it just the i form. Now, the probability, uh, when we feed random bits into this machine, the probability of getting that particular string is just 2 to the minus length of the string. Because if it had 10 bits in it, if L was 10, the chances of getting any particular 10-bit string would be 2 to the minus 10. So uh, two to this expression gives the probability of any of that particular program. And if we consider all possible ways of getting, <coughs> of achieving X as output, we just sum over all of these programs. And we get the, this particular, pro this universal probability of X, which is what we have here. To sum over all of these uh, probabilities and get the total probability of all programs. <coughs> now, uh, it's easy to use this distribution for uh, prediction. All you do is this. Supposing you have a string x and you want to know the probability that 1 is going to be the next uh, symbol. Okay? That's uh, a model for extremely general kind of sequential prediction. So all you do is you take the universal probability associated with this, with x followed by a 1, and you divide it by the, <coughs> the universal probabilities set associated with the thing, next bit being 0 and the next bit being 1. So uh, similarly, you get the probability of 0 being the next one. Now, uh, Five years later, in 1965, Cole McGraw had not yet read my paper, and he independently discovered Cole complexity. The Cole complexity of the string symbols X is the length of the shortest program for a reference uh, computer that produces X as output. It's closely related to the universal distribution. And you see why this is true. Uh, if K is the Kolmogorov complexity of X, that is the shortest program for it, then 2 to the minus K is the largest term in this sum. And the sum, it's a sort of approximation of the sum. It's not a particularly good approximation. But it is approximation, and it's good enough for some applications. Uh, initially, Komogoro was interested in this complexity as a way to define randomness, and he was interested in the mathematical properties of this concept of, concept, uh, of uh, complexity itself. He was surprised to learn of my earlier work on inductive inference, and he publicized my discoveries in the Soviet Union, and for many years, it was much better known there than in the United States. I was puzzled that Komogorov hadn't thought of using these concepts for inductive inference. He certainly did a lot of important work in probability. One of his first great works was the axiomization of probability, and he had done an enormous amount of important work on practical applications of probability. I asked um, Leonid Levin, who was one of the students at that time, how it was that Komogor had missed this important discovery. Leonid suggested that inductive inference was at that time not really a mathematical problem. I wasn't much satisfied with that idea <coughs> at first, but thinking about it later, it might have been that at that time, 1965, there was no good general definition of induction, no general criterion for how good an inductive system was. After my initial discovery, I tried to find a good criterion for the accuracy of this prediction method. I finally thought of a good criterion. This is what it is. Supposing we had some unknown probabilistic algorithm and it could be described in a finite number of bits. And this algorithm produces a long sequence of symbols according to its probabilistic rule. <coughs> then we have this uh, universal induction system, and it's supposed to give probabilities to each symbol in terms of the previous symbols. And, 
does its own induction and has its own way of uh, own rules. Now, for a very good induction system and a long enough sequence, the probabilities given by the true generator of the sequence and the one that is a prime approximated should converge so they're all eventually they're about the same. So that's the criterion of a good induction system. While the criterion would seem very reasonable, I was at first unable to prove it. Well, in 1968, I was asked to review a paper on inductive inference by David Willis. Though I was familiar with the ideas in this paper, it took me about six months to really understand the paper. Willis had taken my system for induction and made it into an exact, rigorously defined system had an error criteria satisfied, but certainly not good enough to convince the proof that the system was all much good for a prediction. He showed that the average ratio of the correct probability to the estimated probability approached 1 as the length of the beta sequence increased. But the individual probability ratios could be quite large or quite small. And, uh, the true and the estimated individual probabilities could be actually quite different. So the fact that the average value and ratio, uh, average value and ratio converged really wasn't a very strong uh, argument. However, I was able to improve this result and show that the expected value of the square and the difference in the probabilities between the correct and the estimated values approach zero faster than one over n. So uh, this was 
was an extremely strong <coughs> result. Uh, it was, this was true for any kind of um, algorithm that has a finite description. And later, we showed for it was also true in a slightly different way for algorithms that had the <coughs> long descriptions. Um, um, I call this uh, result the convergence theorem because uh, you know, the convergence of the error is zero. It, it really seemed to make it clear that the universal distribution gave good, very, very good probability estimates. I sent in a strong recommendation that Willis's paper be published with no revisions, but the other reviewers had already rejected it. They felt that it had little to add to my original paper. Uh, as an aside, I later found out who the other two reviewers were, and they were both real experts in the field of the paper. They were really smart guys, but they didn't get, well, anyway, I wrote Will and tell him <laughs> what a great paper it was and suggested that he send it to another journal, and he did this and was published in a couple of years. Uh, now, this first convergence theorem was for a, a normalized universal distribution on, potential, on potentially infinite sequences of symbols. Peter Gotch showed that it was also true for an unnormalized distribution. An unnormalized distribution isn't nearly, seemed to me to be not nearly as good an approximation as Reginald uh, as sequence. And um, it turns out that there is a appreciable difference between using the normal unnormalized and the normalized uh, distribution as an approximation to the true probability. The normalized one gives much better results normally. I, I didn't realize it was until recently. Uh, the um, convergence theorem has been extended even further, though. And Marcus Cutter showed that the person worked for arbitrary, non-binary alphabet, which was no surprise. But he also showed that it was true for a variety of loss functions, and one of them extremely general. And this is rather important, because uh, there's been a lot of recent work on uh, uh, problems of prediction with unusual or different loss functions from the non, uh, mean square loss function that we used in this particular paper. Uh, recently, though, I showed that the um, this Convergence theorem is also true for grammatical induction. Uh, this, in this case, the data is just a set of strings, of uh, finite strings. They could be the uh, accepted sentences, say, acceptable sentences in some formal language or in some uh, real language, actually. <coughs> I also showed that it worked for operator induction, in which the finite strings are the probabilistic answers to questions that have been generated by an unknown stochastic question answering algorithm. I'll tell more about this later. While the accuracy of the universal distribution as a predictor is certainly important, there are other important features. One of the things it, that's nice about it is that we could use it to predict on non-stationary time series. This is pretty important. Another thing is we obtain an optimum solution to the problem of overfitting or underfitting data. And because of this optimum fitting, there's no need to divide the data into a training set and a test set. And this is quite revolutionary. It's possible to use, a third, another possibility, it's possible to use partial recursive functions to model our data. To my knowledge, no one has actually tried this. But the system I will describe later will try it. <laughs> Whether it gets better uh, results than uh, using only recursive models remains to be seen. Now, while all these features are very beautiful, there seem to be at first uh, a very serious problem that the universal probability was incomputable. Surprisingly enough, this turned out to be not a bug, but a uh, uh, 
Before I explain a brief discussion of uncertainty in prediction, there are two kinds of uncertainty in statistical results, at least two. The best known is uncertainty in probability values due to finite sample size. If you have a binary string with n bits and half of them are 0 and half of them are 1, then the probability of 1 being the next bit is about 1 half plus or minus 1 half divided by the square root of n. So the longer n is, the less error you have in your prediction. Now, all kinds of old prediction with finite samples have this problem of sample size. Error in prediction due to sample size. The kind of uncertainty I'm going to talk about, however, is not due to sample size. It's all due to model uncertainty. When analyzing empirical data, there are normally an infinite number of models that can be used to analyze the data. Some of them will give good predictions. Others will give poor predictions. In any finite amount of time, you can only evaluate a finite number of them. So the universal distribution tells us that whenever we find a model that seems to fit the data well, we can't be sure that there isn't another model that will give much, much better predictions. There's no way to avoid this. In finite time, you can only consider a finite number of models. The incomputability of the universal distribution is related to the fact that it evaluates all possible models, and it takes an infinite amount of time to do it. Let's look at it another way. The exact value of pi or the square root of 2 is, in a certain sense, incomputable. But we know how to make approximations, and we know that the approximations will eventually convert to correct values. For the universal distribution, we can also make approximations, and we know that they will eventually convert to correct values. However, the difference is this. In the case of the approximation for pi, we know at each point, or have a good upper bound on the limits of error. In the case of approximations to the universal distribution, at no point in our approximation can we know how much error there is. Or we have an upper bound, but it's so large that it's not of any use at all. Furthermore, it's not a small effect. No matter how many models we try and how long we try, there's always a very real possibility that we have not yet considered a particularly good model, and that we could find it if we just spent a few more minutes in search. Now, it turns out that any complete predictive system, one satisfying the convergence theorem, must be incomputable. And this is not difficult to show. For any computable prediction system, there must be regularities that are invisible to it. And if the data has those regularities, we have errors of unknown size. And they can be arbitrarily large. So all computable prediction methods, not just approximations to the universal distribution, have errors of unknown size. There's no way to avoid this. It's a property of probability itself. Now, certain scientists have expressed much confidence in their estimates of probability of catastrophic failure in nuclear reactors, national defense systems, and in public safety regulations for genetic engineering. The considerations I've mentioned lead one to question this confidence. There is a tendency to try to deal with this issue by avoiding the use of the incomputable universal distribution. But this doesn't face the problem. The problem is that the empirical probability itself is incomputable. 
an approximation to what always had occurred of unknown size. The study of the universal distributions has made this uncertainty clear, and we shouldn't punish the reporter for bringing the bad news. <coughs> Another apparent difficulty with the universal distribution is its subjectivity. When the universal distribution is mentioned, there are two possible meanings of universal. First, that the error will converge to zero rapidly if the algorithm generating the data has a small, finite description. This is true for all such generating algorithms. This is what I mean by universal distribution. Now, another interpretation of universality is that we can usefully employ the same universal distribution for all problems. This is what I call a half-truth. The same universal distribution will indeed work for all problems, but for most, it will work very poorly. The errors will converge very slowly. To get, a good, to get good predictions, we usually have to use a different universal distribution for each problem domain. And uh, the system that I'm going to describe is built around that idea. <coughs> when I speak of a priori distribution or a prior information, what I mean is information available before the data in the problem is known. And so on, that I mean. As soon as some data is used to solve a problem, the statistician's a priori is updated to reflect that new information. So we have a continually changing a priori distribution throughout the life of the statistician that reflects the problem solved during his or her life. A philosopher may ask, in fact, they do ask, is there not a universal a priori probability distribution in which you have no prior information? Well, let me give you an analogy. If I had no food, water, or air to breathe, what would I do? Well, I wouldn't do very much. I'd probably die quickly. <laughs> if I had no a priori information, there would be very little that I could do to solve a statistical problem. And that's it. Uh, a high priori information, if you have no a priori information uh, and you want to have a sort of a, a priori uh, distribution or anything like that, I, I think the distribution is, would be of approximately zero value. You have to have real information before you uh, before you could do any kind of prediction at all. The nature of the a priori information that a person has is difficult to characterize. However, we normally have to use only part of our a priori information. For a specific, well, let me talk <coughs> on that. I said that uh, uh, fortunately, we don't get into this uh, position where we have no a priori information. Normally, we're born with a fairly good a priori knowledge of the world we live in. Uh, this a priori information enables us to learn to walk, to talk, and communicate. And it's very unlikely that we ever learn these things if we didn't have this a priori the nature of the a priori information that a person has after he's been living a long time is extremely difficult to characterize. However, we normally have to use only part of this information. For a specific problem, we often have very strong ideas as to what functions would be useful to solve this problem. In this case, we would augment the, augment the instruction set of our universal computer those particular functions. If we're less certain of what functions are needed, we might use a set of instructions that has been designed for a more general prediction method. Such sets of instructions are C++ libraries or parts of Mathematica or Maple or MATLAB. If the instructions we inserted are not relevant to the correct probability function, the convergence rates will be very slow, but it will eventually convert to the correct values. So, 
the subjectivity, the fact that it is based on our choice of which universal machine to use, is characteristic of all prediction systems based on uh, a priori probability distributions. The choice of a universal machine and its instruction set is a necessary parameter in the system that enables us to insert a priori information into it. The dependence of the universal distribution on choice of machine is not a bug in the system. It's a necessary feature. <coughs> now, my main goal in studying universal prediction as distributions wasn't especially prediction, but strong AI. For me, this means writing a program that could work most scientific problems much better than a human can. Many years ago, about the time we discovered the universal distribution, Neil and Simon uh, programmed GPS, the general problem solver, a program that was meant to solve a great variety of problems. In fact, it only solved a small subset of what we call inversion problems and in a very deterministic way. But perhaps its most important defects were that it had no concept of probability and it was absolutely <coughs> unable to learn anything. If you gave it a problem and after a long time it finally solved it with great difficulty, then you gave it the same problem the next day, it would solve the problem in the same difficult way, taking the same long time. Nevertheless, the AI community was pretty much taken with Newell and Simon approach, and for many years there was relatively little work in AI involving learning or probability. I say li relatively little, but there was, and it kept growing. Anyway, in about 1985, about 25 years later, at an annual meeting of the American Association for Artificial Intelligence, a vote was taken and it was decided the probability was in no way relevant to artificial intelligence. <laughs> uh, a protest group quickly <coughs> formed and the next year there was a symposium at the AAAI meeting devoted to uncertainty in AI, most of which involved probability and learning. The symposium has continued to be a yearly event to the present day. As part of the protest at the first uh, symposium, I gave a paper on applying universal distribution to problems in AI. Uh, this was an early ver version of the system that I've been developing since that time. My interest has always been in a much more general class of problem solver than that envisioned by Newton and Simon. The system I've been working on solved problems in both probabilistic and deterministic answers, and learning is an integral part of the system. It's designed to learn to solve two kinds of problems. Almost all problems in science and engineering are of these two kinds. The first kind is function inversion. These are the P and NP problems of computational complexity theory. They include theorem proving, solutions of equations, involved integration, and a lot of other things. The second kind of problem is time-limited optimization, inductive inference, surface reconstruction, image restoration, or a few examples. Designing an automobile in six months, satisfying certain specifications, and having a minimum cost is another example. The general understanding of probability that we obtained through the universal distribution <coughs> enabled us to make programs that can learn to solve both of these kinds of problems in a manner that seems to follow the acquisition of new skills by humans. In the infant machine, we have a bunch of problem solving <coughs> techniques, and these are put into the machine by the trainer or the designer. We have a conditional probability distribution based on the previous experience of the trainer and the machine that suggests which problem solving techniques should be used with which problems. 
Now, the experience system has many more problem solving techniques. When the system is given a new problem, when the experience system is given a new problem, it uses its previous experience with similar problems to decide which problem solving techniques to try and how much time is spent on them, which is the important part. This experience is embodied in a general conditional probability distribution. This distribution gives the probability that each problem solving technique will be the best technique for solving any particular problem. The condition on the conditional probability distribution is the problem to be solved or the description of the problem to be solved. And the distribution itself is going to be on the probability that each problem solving technique will be the very best way to solve that particular problem. Now, the system uses this probability distribution to decide how much time to spend on each problem solving technique. After the problem is solved, the general condition of probability distribution is modified. The problem solving technique may be modified, augmented, or completed in view of recent experience. The last talk I gave at Royal Holloway, I guess, um, maybe five years ago, was at a symposium on the importance of being learnable. It was a description of some ideas I had on transfer learning. How learning in one domain could be utilized, could utilize information in other apparently completely different domains. Now, much of, much of my recent work has been in developing and understanding the updating system that enables the general conditional probability distribution to implement direct and transfer learning from both successful and unsuccessful problem solving event trials. And that's it. So are there any other any questions that you have or suggestions or comments? spoke, it, it connected in my mind with a debate among psychologists mm -hmm. um, about how children learn language. Yes. And uh, right. as you probably know, um, Chomsky and right. Stephen Pinker and people um, argue that language is such a complicated thing right. that children must have a lot of inborn knowledge. Sure. And other psychologists have taken a contrastive view. Um, mm -hmm. From what you're saying, it sounds as if you would support the, the Chomsky Pinker oh, yes. position. Yeah, very definitely. Uh, I, I had this idea for a, a long before I was reading Chomsky. Uh, interestingly enough, the uh, basis of this was um, um, what happened was the way I discovered this almost was this. Uh, there was a uh, <coughs> conference, the first tip through uh, workshop on AI in 1956. And uh, uh, everyone working on AI over the world, well, not everyone, but a lot of people came there. There weren't a whole lot of them. <laughs> and uh, as a result of that sort of workshop, I wrote a paper called an Inductive Inference Machine, which is sort of the beginning of the work I'm doing now. Uh, at the same conference that I was giving this talk, Chomsky gave a talk on uh, three models for the, the description of language. And uh, I had gotten into a lot of trouble with the system I had. I thought when I started the system that I knew enough about probability that I should be able to deal with any problems in learning or anything like that. Uh, I was wrong. Uh, however, I worked on this a long time, and then I thought that Chom some of Chomsky's ideas uh, were very 
close to some ideas that I had about generating complex objects for induction, and I was interested in using uh, formal languages for induction. So I devised a probabilistic version of uh, Chomsky's languages, and uh, I tried to find the most general probabilistic language, which turned out to be the universal distribution, and that's how it all started. Uh, I'm sure that the Chomsky is sort of right about this stuff, that uh, it would be absolutely impossible to learn languages as rapidly as children do without a lot of a priori knowledge. And what they're doing now is trying to find out the nature of the general grammar that is sort of built into uh, children at birth. Uh, one of the really difficult things about language, though, is this, that, uh, you know, we have grammar rules, and uh, every language, uh, or most languages, have, have grammar rules and things like that. But the fact of the matter is that while people use grammar rules to some extent to generate sentences, uh, one of the things that happens to languages, they, they make, um, people make up their own little grammar rules that are easily uh, figured out by other people. That is, they make inductive generalizations of any kind at all, and these are picked up by other people. And the language is constantly growing and constantly changing. And it constantly, it usually has in the background some basic grammar rules, but deviating from them is always happening. And if you listen to people talk, uh, most of the things they say are <coughs> Um, however, still, to even, to even begin to understand the intent of this stuff, before you get to the point where you start changing the language around, I think you really do have to have some basic a priori knowledge, and this is probably built into us, or certainly built into us. <coughs> there was another problem about this, though, and that, uh, in physics, there's a thing called the uh, anthropic principle. The idea is this, that if the, the laws of the universe seem to be designed for man alone, <laughs> that if they were, if the constant constants in our universe were just slightly different from what they had, or are now, uh, the universe would be so different that uh, stars would not arise as a whole. We would we'd never have a place to live at all. So the question was, how does this thing arise? Uh, and uh, we don't know, really. So it, it, uh, one of the postulates is that the, there are many different uh, universes being generated at random. And uh, one of them happens to be us. And we happen to be the one in which uh, the constants are right for our, um, our coming into existence. Well, you, there's a similar problem in epistemology, really, about where we get this a priori information. Uh, my, I'm, I'm certain that the way we get it is by evolution, that uh, very simple creatures have very simple a priori ideas about the universe around them. And they're not able. They're able to learn a little bit, but not very much. And uh, creatures evolve, and as they evolve, they become better and better at taking advantage of uh, regularities in their environment to keep them alive and to reproduce. Life in general is the ability to reproduce in a very noisy, difficult environment. It's possible to make systems that can be, that can reproduce in a very, very restricted environment, like crystals, for instance. They have to have, uh, say, a solution surrounding them with a high concentration of certain salts. And they can't, under those conditions, they could go with no other ones. Certain computer programs could easily reproduce because the CPU has a copy instruction. Uh, but the really interesting cases are 
situations in which we have programs that can be reproduced when there's noise, or that can reproduce when there's noise, or in general, creatures that can reproduce in very adverse conditions uh, that they were not specifically designed for. And that's what's interesting about life. So what happens is we have life evolving to be able to heal. Well, to some extent, one direction that life evolves, at least, is in a direction of being able to deal with more and more difficult, more and more complex environments where it is difficult to stay alive. And uh, that's how we got here. Now, we wouldn't be here if we did not have a sequence of, a training sequence of challenging environments that made it necessary for us to evolve, evolve to get to this state. Uh, so in that sense, uh, that's part of the anthropic um, principle also, that, uh, that <laughs> we somehow have to have had that particular sequence of things happening or else you wouldn't exist. Yes? What are the problems with artificial intelligence, well, let's say, in, in, in the field of artificial intelligence, is that although everyone can identify examples of intelligent behavior, yeah. examples of intelligent sure. solutions, yeah. I haven't really seen any, like a general definition of what intelligence is. Oh, and um, I'm wondering if... Okay, well, for, um, for a long time, uh, there were, for a kind of say, a long time, uh, one criterion <laughs> that had once been proposed was uh, Turing's test. That you're probably familiar with that. And that uh, the idea was uh, if you had a machine answering questions uh, via teletype or uh, some uh, method like that, so you can actually see the machine, uh, could you uh, tell the difference between the machine and the person answering the question? Uh, it has become uh, abundantly clear that this, is, this doesn't <laughs> answer the question at all. It's a, a, it becomes a question of how, how do you go about fooling the person? <laughs> that's, and you can write the programs that will fool people. Uh, that's real. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, this test had been passed, as far as I can tell, uh, a long time ago. Um, Douglas Lennett went to a program called AM, and uh, some people were playing with the program, and uh, the re answers it gave were so, they thought intelligent that they felt that there was really, uh, that Lennett was cheating, and that he was really <laughs> There was a man inside the machine. <laughs> <laughs> now, the, the kind of intelligence this, this, this machine had was really pretty uh, nominal. Uh, as far as speaking English, it did speak English, but it had the kind of it had a very limited vocabulary, and it had speak it would speak English as well as the machine at the checkout counter of the supermarket does. It just prints out things. It really didn't know what he was doing. But it did, uh, was able to do some fairly interesting things in the sense of finding reasons for certain kinds of reasoning, reasons for making certain kinds of deductions. So the guys looking at the machine really felt that it was pretty intelligent. Uh, I myself have never gotten into this problem at all. And, uh, I felt one of the reasons they wanted this was that you could use a criterion for intelligence in a kind of a hill climbing uh, technique. What you do is you work on this machine a little bit, and if it gets more intelligent, you try and move in that direction more. Or you get to a new position and you try to make changes and so forth. Uh, to do that, you need a very good uh, very sharp definition of intelligence, and I don't think there is anything like that. Any kind of uh, criterion you have, you have a lot of noise in it, and the feedback. So it'd be, you could do this, but it would be very difficult. 
my own take on this is I'm really not interested in that at all. And uh, I feel that I personally could tell whether a machine was doing something useful or not. That uh, at the high level, it's certainly easy to tell that the machine is being intelligent. It's solving problems that you can't solve and no one else can. And or it's doing things much more rapidly solving them much more rapidly than you can. So in that sense, you could recognize high-level intelligence. The difficult, difficult part is to recognize, one, not so intelligent things, and whether you are on the path to it. And this is what I think I understand enough. Uh, my theory is that uh, new, new good ideas are made by combining old good ideas. And uh, a, an intelligent system will do this well. And, uh, and that's about it. And you can watch it doing things. And if it doesn't, and if, if what it does doesn't seem to extrapolate to doing more complex problems, then as far as you're concerned, as, as far as I'm concerned, it's not intelligent. Uh, I think I know enough about <coughs> my system anyway to tell whether it's getting anywhere, whether the new problems it solves are indeed uh, more difficult in a useful way than uh, what I had before. <clears throat> in fact, recently a colleague of mine programmed a machine to do something like uh, one of the, something like the system that I've been writing about all these then able to do an interesting thing. Uh, what it did was this. He gave it a particular problem. Uh, it's a classic problem in AI called the Towers of Hanoi. You have a bunch of piles of disk and you have to transfer one pile to another pile. And normally, if they're n, n disk, it takes something like two to the n uh, transfers to do this. And most uh, programs find it very difficult to learn how to do it. Anyway, so we gave this problem to the system and it wasn't able to do it. I, that is, it wasn't able to get the recursive solution. It, it did solve it for a few values. And, and so then what he did was he gave it another problem that, would, that required a recursive solution also. Uh, the problem was uh, generating the sequence of n1s followed by n2s. He gives the number, and he gives the machine the number n, and he's supposed to give that output. Now, uh, he could do, uh, easily learn to do this for one, two, and three, and so forth. And eventually, it got a recursive solution. It took a long time, but if you get it, uh, it got a recursive solution, so you put it in, and would do it. So after it solved the recursive problem, its biases on what trials it would take were considerably changed. And when it gave it the, when it gave it the problem of towers of Hanoi, it was able to solve it. It took a long time, but it did. And to my knowledge, no other uh, pro, uh, AI system has done that particular thing. Now, uh, I looked at this program very carefully, and uh, at the present time, I'm not really sure that, it, that it's doing anything useful. It's very difficult to analyze these things, and uh, I really don't know. I, I, I'm interested in it, and uh, I would like to use modify its methods to use in my own system. Uh, and the question is, are can it be done? And I'm, at the present time, I'm not sure. It's it's very it's often a very difficult thing. The, general, the, the real test of the, system, of the whole thing, though, is can you get it to work progressively more and more difficult problems empirically? So in spite of any analysis I might make, if this guy is able to get it to work more and more difficult pro problems that are recursive or anything like that, then he's right. Yes? Um, if you're a young PhD student to start your PhD, how, does, how do you spend the next three years? 
What, what? <laughs> if you were a young PhD student, at the start of your three years, how would you spend your next three years? <laughs> uh, see, the, yeah, you mean you're interested in AI, I say? Well, I should say I'm at the end of my PhD. Oh, you're at right the end of your PhD? Yeah. Oh, so you want to be a um, postdoc? Hopefully, yeah. Mm -hmm. But you're in this? Are you in this field? Uh, genetic programming. Okay. <coughs> well, as you probably know, uh, Rosa has been doing some interesting work in genetic programming, and he's been getting some interesting results. Uh, my own impression is that, uh, that it, the system that the system he uses is essentially extremely inefficient, and that uh, usually genetic programming is <coughs> the very nice thing about it. Though it is usually universal, so that any conceivable uh, answer to the problem is in some sense accessible to it. Uh, it may be that it takes too much time, though. And um, as advising you, I can't I don't know what to say, really. I think that uh, you'll draw that to a close. <laughs> um, in case somebody else asks what they're going to call the third chair. Um, I'd like now to invite uh, Professor Phil Darby from the University College to uh, move the vote today. Well, I'm sure I speak for everybody when I say that we couldn't have had a more appropriate and stimulating inaugural Komogorov lecture. I have uh, found uh, depths of uh, understanding and breadth of the overall picture in this brief presentation, which have uh, really <coughs> left me with plenty to think about for, for months and years ahead. I think it's particularly appropriate uh, for the current occasion. We're here to honor the memory of uh, Kolmo Gorov, whose 100th birthday it would be. And uh, as uh, the, the range of, of activities in the mathematics and outside mathematics that Komogorov undertook is phenomenal, but he is particularly well known for uh, his work in probability on the one hand and uh, complexity on the other. And it's not just on the one hand on the other, because uh, they do, of course, have very strong links. Uh, although Komogorov himself probably uh, didn't make those links as, as strongly as Ray Solomonoff has done. Um, it's interesting and appropriate too that uh, as well as the uh, local computer <coughs> learning research center, this meeting is being sponsored by both the British Computer Society and the Royal Statistical Society. Uh, and both Kolmogorov and Solomonoff uh, have had one foot firmly in each of those camps and done a lot to bring those two together. Um, I myself have for some years been trying to occupy some of that no man's land, uh, not many man's land anyway, uh, <laughs> between the two subjects and uh, finding it utterly fascinating. Coming from the statistical end and looking over to what's going on in, uh, in computer science and, and, and there's so much that needs to be transferred between the two. There are uh, places like, like Royal Holloway where, where that is an active uh, thing that's going on, which I, I, I'm very impressed by. Um, Ray Solomonoff has, well, he hasn't so much brought together Kolmogorov complexity and probability as starting to fall off in the first place before Kolmogorov. Uh, 
So uh, we owe to him the genesis of these fascinating ideas. Um, and the whole business of, of learning and induction, which has been so important to statistics for so long, is now uh, an enormous research field in computer science. And I know we statisticians have a lot to learn from it. I'd actually like to get just a tiny bit technical. I don't want to uh, bore you in it, because I'm sure I can't uh, talk about these things with the same <coughs> touch that, that Ray has done. Uh, but I, I've got, uh, I, I, was, I was very interested in a lot of the specific points made about uh, merging of the uh, specific distributions and, and the universal distribution, for example. There's one point which I think could be brought into this equation, wasn't specifically mentioned, and that's thinking not so much about whether two different distributions are going to end up saying essentially the same thing, as uh, thinking more about the fit between uh, an attempted explanation of a data sequence and in some sense the data themselves. How well do the data, how well does the explanation fit? Not the best explanation, but the data. And we need different criteria for thinking about fit between probabilistic explanations and data. But that, they, these have been produced and they can be done. And they do actually tie up very closely with, with many of the ideas on, on, for example, merging that we've heard about. And you can show that two different, for example, two different systems which, in a certain sense, both are good explanations of data must merge for that particular data sequence. And what can they merge on but the universal probabilities? I'm also interested very much in, in, in the latter part of the talk about the, the idea of uh, learning from your mistakes and doing better and tuning things and the idea of self-tuning universal machines, as it were. Uh, but of course, even a self-tuning universal machine uh, which keeps, which you, you, as you go on and learn new things and you change and, and, and you change your machine a bit, even that can be regarded as issuing a single sequence of probabilistic predictions for the sequence you've got to see. And in that sense, is nothing else than another universal machine. So uh, it's just another. Uh, is there a universal universal machine? In other words, we do the self tuning, and I think the. Um, the answer is, well, maybe, but uh, well, how can, But that's not the important question. The important question is, how can we approximate it? And that's what uh, I, I was particularly fascinated by the specific ideas that uh, Ray Solomon was bringing forward in how we can actually approximate these utterly uncomputable things and never know how well we're going to do, but at least do a job. So I look forward to, uh, to moving that more closely. Um, as I'm sure you can tell, I've been enormously stimulated by, by this lecture. It's also not very often the answers to questions are as stimulating as the lecture itself. Um, I appreciate it enormously, and I and ask you to all join with me in a uh, vote of thanks to press on.